Hey everyone, welcome to another session of TNT. Sorry I don't have my intro music, but I'm in the church, so I didn't think I should uh, play uh, ACDC while I'm here in the church. Uh, last week I was talking about the Mass, the Eucharist, uh, some of the roots of it in the sacred scriptures. Uh, and then also I read from the letter of St. Justin Martyr in the year 150 AD, talking about the Mass, the Eucharist. We could see in this ancient letter. Uh, the flow of the Mass, the same flow that we have this very day, even though we know that over the centuries there's been different developments with the Mass, sometimes radically changes in the rites with the approval of the Church. So I thought today what I'd talk about is what we use within the Mass, uh, the sacred vessels and the sacred vestments. Uh, and then hopefully this week uh, I'll have an opportunity to then talk about different parts of the Mass, how do you, how do you enter into those different parts of the Mass, what's the different dynamics of the movement of the heart and the mind in it, because there are all there are many different dynamics at work, and if we're not aware of what we're doing at mass, well, then many times the heart and mind is not going to be able to truly experience what the Lord is seeking to carry out through it. But so today was a practical thing, just to talk about the vessels and the vestments, uh, because the mass is the representation of our Lord's death and resurrection. Uh, it is the celebration of the sacred mysteries. We use sacred things. And so what we use in the Mass, we don't use in other things. Uh, these, there are certain things that we set aside, we say this is just for the Mass, this is just for uh, the Eucharist. Now, let's start with some of the sacred objects that we use, uh, some of the sacramentals. I have some over here behind me. Uh, hopefully you can see it okay. I'll try to bring things forward. Uh, first thing here, as you see already set up, this is the chalice set up in the chalice veil and the verse. Uh, the reason why it's in black is because today we celebrate All Souls Day. And when a priest celebrates Mass for All Souls Day, he can celebrate using white vestments, he can use uh, violet, purple vestments, or he can use black. And since it's the only time also in funerals the priest has the same option to use those colors, you don't get to see the black very often. And since I also have a Mass coming up today at All Souls Day, I already had this set up. So uh, here we have before us everything that goes with the chalice. I'll show you everything in just a second. But we have the chalice, we have what's called ciboriums, we have the cruets, uh, and we also have the lavabo dish for the wash of hands. So with the chalice, you have different things that are used with the chalice. The first thing you see on top here, this is called a burse. This is not uh, required uh, in the celebration of the mass, the burse. The chalice veil is actually, uh, priests are supposed to use a chalice veil. A lot of priests don't. Uh, are they doing anything invalid? No, but it's just, it's what the documents call for. But the bursts is just a very practical thing. It, it matches the chalice veil. What it keeps inside is called the corporal. And I'll get to the corporal in just a minute, but I first want to go through the chalice. The chalice is covered uh, by what's called the chalice veil. Uh, and think about with a bride, when a bride is getting married, she wears her veil, she many of them as they come forward and then as before the vows are said then the veil is lifted showing her true beauty well think about with the church we are the bride of Christ and the Lord comes to us uh, in many powerful ways but none more powerful than through the Eucharist and the chalice is going to be an instrument for us for the wine to be used for the wine to become the blood of Christ and so we cover the chalice with a veil uh, it's also a way of separating the parts of the Mass, which I'll get into another time. That we have the part of the Liturgy of the Word, so the focus at that point is on the Word. We're not focusing yet on the sacrifice, so that's the ultimate thing that we're entering into. Uh, but it's after Liturgy of the Word, then we have the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And so that's why also why the chalice is covered, because the focus is not yet on the moment of the offertory, the sacrifice. But when we unveil the chalice at the time of the offertory, then you have other things that are stacked on the chalice. What you have here is, so here's the chalice. Then you have this cloth here that's called the purificator, because you're going to use this to purify, to clean the chalice of the precious blood that was within the chalice. Then you have, let me put this down for a second. On top of the purificator, you have this little dish. This is called a patent. And the, on the patent is the host. Right now, this is just bread uh, that will become the body of Christ. And then what covers that, this is called the pall. And the pall, sometimes just used most of the time, you see it's just white. It uh, doesn't really have any decorative, uh, any decorations on it. This one does. Uh, it has uh, 
the image of Christ on it. And they all have their purpose. Now, how do you know the difference between a chalice and what's called the ciborium? One is that the chalice always doesn't have a cover. Uh, we're covering with these things, but there's no lid that goes on the chalice. The chalice can have different shapes. The chalice, the church does call for the chalice to be made of a sacred metal, uh, a precious metal. So it has to be made of gold or silver. Uh, can't be made of wood, can't be made of clay. Even though maybe at the Last Supper, our Lord, the actual cups that he would have used probably were made of some type of clay of some sort. But the reason why the church says it has to be a sacred, uh, used as a precious metal, I should say, is one is because the danger of is anything that's porous, can you actually have the precious blood start to kind of seep into it? Um, and so that's one reason. Also, the, that why it can't be like glass, because it also, you don't want it to break. Uh, and so it can't be made of glass, can't be made of clay. It has, it can't be a ceramic or anything like that. It does have to be of a precious metal. Now, I'll just show you. These are other types of chalices we have here. So you can see the shape is, this one's somewhat similar, but it's a little more decorative. You have these images of, on the stem of these different angels. Uh, this one you can see kind of has a wider cup uh, that the parish has here. That with uh, some chalices can be extremely decorative. And because it's knowing that this is we're using this as the instrument to be able to bring forth our Lord. And so um, a lot of times parishes will have very decorated, very at times expensive chalices. But it's because people say we want to give the best to the Lord uh, since he's coming to us in such humility. All right, so the, you have the chalice. Uh, then you have here... These are what we put the bread in that will become the, the inside will be the blood of Christ, a uh, body of Christ, I mean, sorry. Uh, and these are called ciboriums. Between the chalice and ciborium, mainly because they have covers, as you can see these do. It's pretty simple on the inside, nothing really exciting inside there. Uh, but there's different sizes, different shapes. Some are very small, some are very big. Then you get these, this, uh, this size, same thing. This has the lid on it. So that's how you know these are the ciboriums. All right, but let's get back now to around with the chalice, uh, things that we use with it. So we use, this is called, as I mentioned, the pall. Now the purpose of the pall is pretty basic, that the purpose of the pall is to cover the chalice so that nothing falls inside. Uh, in particular, before air conditioning, you have churches that would have windows uh, to help kind of just circulate the air through or help cool down a church. Uh, and so then you had the danger of bugs coming in. And so the Paul, his basic purpose was to cover the chow so nothing goes inside. As I mentioned, the purificator, the purpose of that is then after we've consumed the precious blood, there's still at times uh, remnants within the chow. So then we pour water inside and then we uh, dry it with the purificator. And the purificator, when that's cleaned, we don't just take it and just throw it in a wash machine. We will take the purificator soak it in some water for usually a couple hours so that if there's any remains of the precious blood in the purificator the water is now not only as overwhelmed in a way the the precious blood where then when you have more water than you do in the precious blood it ceases to be the precious blood because it's dissolved so the, the purificator is first uh you have it sit in water for a little bit then you rinse it out. That water, after you rinse it out, you pour into the ground or down the sacrarium, which I've talked about before. That's the sink in the sacristy where the pipe goes directly into the ground and we only pour uh, water or, or if, for example, somebody uh, has spit out the precious, the Eucharist, we have that sit in water until it dissolves and we pour that down the sacrarium as well. But it's a way of reverencing our Lord. We don't pour it down the sink where it's then gonna go into any like septic system and things like that. All right, the other cloth I mentioned, this one's called the corporal. Now, the corporal has a couple of purposes. One is that when the priest or the deacon unfolds the corporal on the altar, it's that sense of that what's placed on the corporal, this is what's going to become uh, our Lord. Uh, and so it's a sense of uh, a sacred spot on the altar, even though the altar is sacred, even that with the corporal, it's this, what I am uh, going to be offering, it goes on the corporal. But also, importantly for the corporal, 
The corporal is also meant to catch if there's any particles of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, let me move the chalice here for a second. Whoops. So with the corporal, when the priest or, or deacon unfolds it, it ends up becoming like a big square. But it's also then used that when, for example, when I break the, the large host of the Blessed Sacrament, Sometimes there may be small particles that break off. And even the smallest particles, it's still the body of Christ. It's still our Lord. And so knowing that it usually will break right in the center of the corporal or on the end closest to me, you'll see us then carefully fold up the corporal, keeping any possible particles that we may not see, keeping them within the cloth then. Uh, and then we fold it up at the end so as to fit on top of the chalice or if we're using a verse, inside the verse. And then what we should do is we could use the corporal a couple times, several masses in a row, but that's why we should never like just flip the corporal when we're done to kind of straighten it out or whatever. We are always carefully unfolding in case there's any particles there of, of our Lord. Uh, and then the same thing, just like we do with the purificator, uh, the corporal also when it's time that we have to launder it, laundry it, we will soak it in water first. In case there's any small particles, then they will dissolve in that water. Uh, and then we'll pour that water into the ground or down the secretary. All right, so that's some of the different cloths that we use. These are some of the different vessels we use in the Mass. Uh, these two right here, these are called cruets. And this obviously is what keeps the water and the wine inside. Uh, and then we just simply have what's called the finger towel uh, and the lavabo. This is the dish the priest uses to wash his hands. This little prayer the priest says, he says, Lord, wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sins. Or wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sins. That is, just as he's about to make the offertory, he's praying that the Lord will forgive him of his sins. You also see sometimes we'll use in Mass, we'll use incense. Just like we use, also we use incense. We use them at funerals. We can use it at any Mass, really. Uh, also, we can use incense when we do adoration. And that's what we have over here. We have on the stand here, this is called a thurible. Inside goes a piece, inside the thurible goes a piece of charcoal that we light uh, beforehand. And then, uh, so that charcoal is slowly burning. But then what we do is we put a little bit of incense on. And the incense then, as it lands on the charcoal, it starts to burn. And that's what then gives off the smoke that you see when we use incense. And usually it has a certain aroma, a certain perfume smell. And that when that, that incense is being burned, the smoke is coming up, that's a symbol, it's a sign of our prayers being lifted up to heaven. And that's why you read about it in the scriptures. There's reference of incense uh, in, in the Old Testament that was also used in the temple. And so that we use it as well uh, in the mass or in adoration. Um, and so that what holds the charcoal inside, it's called a thurible, and then what little container that holds the incense itself, this right here, uh, this is called a boat, just like a boat in the sea. And so the incense is put inside there. We scoop it out, pour that on the charcoal where it then lights. Now, the priest wears certain uh, material, certain cloth for the mass that we don't wear outside with other things. Uh, first of all, the general garment of the priest is what I'm wearing right now. This is called a cassock. A uh, cassock goes back to about the 4th century. Uh, it, though the style of the cassock has developed and changed over the years, uh, this is the official garment of the priest. That's why when you see priests walk around, a lot of times we may not see us in our cassock. Uh, you'll see us in what's called clerics. The clerics are a modified version of the cassock, but this is actually the official garment of the priest. That, but when we celebrate Mass, does the priest have to wear the cassock? No, he doesn't. But there are some priests, uh, like myself, I, I like wearing it. I just think there's, again, a connection with the, some of the traditions in the church. Not the sacred tradition, but certain traditions. But the first thing the priest has to wear, he has to wear what's called the alb. It comes from the Latin alba, which means white. Uh, the alb is meant to be of a white color, and it can be made of a linen, or it could be made of uh, cotton, uh, polyester, whatever. But the purpose of the alb is to cover all his clothes. That you, that you're not even. It's the, basically the documents say his street clothes should not be showing, and so the alb is meant to cover all of that. All right. So this is just one version of alb. You see different styles of albs. 
But the main purpose is that the alb is supposed to cover uh, all that the priest wears. If he has a certain alb that doesn't do that, for example, this right here, a certain style called the roaming cut. All right, and as you can see that if I were to put this on, it's not gonna cover my neck uh, or part of my chest. And that's why then the priest wears this. This is called the amos. And the amos then covers first. He puts the amos on first before he puts on the alb. So I'll show you. So basically this amos is like a big white square. All right, and there's a prayer, everything that the priest wears, there is a prayer that accompanies it. And I've got the prayers right over here, so I'm gonna look at the prayers as I say it. So when I'm putting this on, I say, place, O Lord, on my head the helmet of salvation that I may overcome the assaults of the devil. It's got a little cross on there. I don't know if you can see it because it's a little wrinkle there. There's the cross. And so usually the custom is the priest touches the cross to his head. Then he says that prayer as he's tucking this in around his neck, wraps this, this kind of string, rope around, kind of helps it keep it in place. All right. And then if he needs to, he might tuck this in around his neck so it doesn't go flopping around. All right, then he puts the alb on, and it's a prayer for the alb, and it's purify me, O Lord, from all stain, and cleanse my heart, that washed in the blood of the lamb, I may enjoy eternal delights. So then the alb goes on next. So we put that on. And the alb is also a reminder of, excuse me, <laughs> struggling here, <laughs> it's a reminder of our baptism. Uh, think about when a child's baptized, we have the baptismal garment, it's a white garment. And so it's to remind the priest too, of that purity that he's meant to live uh, so that he can worthily offer the mass for the people of God. What goes on next is called the cincture and it's basically a rope. Uh, it goes around uh, the priest's waist. All right, so here's the cincture. And as he's doing it, remember the priest also has made a, the promise of celibacy. So it's a special prayer of praying for that strengthening in it. So as he wraps that around his waist, he prays, Gird me, O Lord, with a cincture of purity, and quench in my heart the fire of concupiscence, that the virtue of continence and chastity may remain in me. So uh, that then wraps around. You can't really see it where you, uh, unless I stand really far away. Uh, but that wraps around the waist. The next thing the priest puts on is called the stole. The stole is a sign of that authority he's been given to celebrate the sacraments. Okay? It's an, it's a, it goes back to, again, to the Roman Empire. It was a sign of the authority, for example, of the of judges. They would wear a stole. Uh, judge, or those in the Senate, things like that, used to wear a stole. Not our Senate, but back in the Roman Empire. So some of the things that had developed in the early life of the church came from just the very life of the people in the Empire of Rome. So the priest puts the stole on. Whenever he celebrates the sacraments, he wears the stole. And it's a different color for its different purpose. Now, I'm gonna, I will put on, uh, let me show you here. I'll just take, grabbing the stole here. So this is a red one. So we have different colors, and the colors have a certain meaning behind them. So here, I'll say the priest will kiss the stole. It usually has a little cross on the back of it. Wraps it, and it hangs straight down. Now, a deacon, this is how you can tell the difference between a priest and a deacon at Mass. One is that the deacon stole hangs differently. It hangs across him like this. And so that's how you can tell if he just has the stole and you say, oh, that's a deacon, that's not a priest. The priest wears it hanging straight over him. Now, depending on the type of vestment he's wearing, which I'll show you in a second, he might actually even wear it going across him like this. This is what the priest used to always wear it this way in the older rite, the extraordinary form. In the Norris Ordo, most priests wear it this way unless they're wearing uh, what's called a Roman vestment. All right, but as we put on the stole, with the prayer that we say is, Restore to me, O Lord, the state of immortality that was lost to me by my first parents. And although I am unworthy to approach your sacred mysteries, grant me nevertheless eternal joy. And so we kind of tighten that rope around, hold everything in place, so that way the vestments aren't like flowing all over the place and we're struggling and kind of tripping all over it. And then we put on the, the, what's called the chasuble, and that's the outward garment. So this is the sign of the priest's authority, the chasuble is to remind the priest of being clothed in love, being clothed in charity. And so that's the outward garment that you see, all right? The chasuble comes from the word, uh, uh, let me take my notes here, because uh, I never remember these things. Uh, it comes from the word kasula, all right? And it's a poncho like cloak of a worker who needed protection from the elements. So that's the history of it. But then the church adopts it, uh, uh, that kind of protecting the priest. Uh, 
It also became known as the Planeta or Penu Penuela, uh, and then it, over time became more ornamental. All right. Now we wear the different colors of the vestments. So I'm going to put the red one on. And now that we wear the red, whenever we're celebrating a mass in honor of the martyrs, or when we're celebrating uh, a mass in honor of the Holy Spirit. So Pentecost, the priest wears red on Pentecost. Whenever we're celebrating a martyr, we wear red. And also on Good Friday and Palm Sunday, we wear red, where obviously it's because our Lord, who died for us, the ultimate martyrdom, uh, that he, uh, we wear red for that. Now, the, there's different styles, different type of decorations you'll see on chasubles. This one's called the St. Andrew's Cross, uh, which I've talked about before and uh, about martyrdom, uh, how St. Andrew's martyred on an X-shaped cross. So that's why you see this, called the St. Andrew's Cross. But we have different colors. We, there's, the, there's black, as I've mentioned, that we wear. We can wear for funerals, but you don't see it really that often. We also wear it on All Souls Day. Uh, also, whenever we're doing a memorial mass for the dead, uh, a priest uh, wears black. We then wear the purple. We wear the purple uh, during Advent. We wear it during Lent uh, uh, or Penitential Day. For example, on January 22nd, we remember the passing of uh, legal, legalization of abortion in our country and all the children who have died due to it. We, we have a, a mass of reparation on that day, and the priest wears purple on that day. Also, the priest can wear the purple when he celebrates funerals. We wear white when we're celebrating a saint's day that wasn't a martyr, or we're celebrating a great solemnity in the church. Just, uh, we just celebrate all saints' day, so yesterday, so the priest wore all white for that. We also wear that during the Christmas season, and we wear it during the Easter season. And then when it's called ordinary time, we wear green. Uh, and so the green, uh, that's just anytime we're not celebrating a saint's day, and it's, in, it's not Lent, it's not Advent, it's not the Christmas season, and it's not the Easter season. We wear green on those days. Now, one other vestment that's a little bit different is what the deacon wears. It's called a dalmatic. Now, the dalmatic, it looks just like the chasuble, but what's different is the dalmatic has sleeves, as you can see there. And so, that, again, that's another way of being able to tell if when you walk in, you see someone, uh, you try to figure out, is that the deacon, is that the priest? It's how is he wearing the stole? And then also, is he wearing a dalmatic? The priest's vestment would not have sleeves. Now, another type of vestment that the priest wears uh, is called the Roman vestment. vestment. Uh, more commonly referred to by priests as a fiddleback. And so here's an example of the Roman cut vestment. And it's called a fiddleback because as you can see here, it kind of has the shape of a fiddle. And, but, uh, and this is called the Roman style vestment. On the back, usually it tends to be more decorative because obviously when this was more commonly used was in the, what we call the extraordinary form, and the priest was always selling mass, celebrating mass ad orientum, meaning that he was facing the east. So his back was always to you because you were all facing the east too. We're all facing east because where is it in the east? Jerusalem. That's where the resurrection, that's where the death and resurrection of the Lord occurred. That's where the new life came to us. So many churches were built facing eastward, and all the faithful were facing eastward, and the priests also facing the same direction as the people. And a lot of times you hear people say, oh, the priest celebrate mass with his back to us. It's not that he, he's turning from you. It's that he's with you, leading you in the, the offering of the mass, facing where our Lord is died and rose facing east so that's called ad orientum it's one of the ways that even with the, the norvis ordo the mass that we uh most of us are familiar with uh, the priest can celebrate that way as well the last thing i'll show you i know i went a little bit long here today uh but i won't have a chance to do it in the church the rest of this week uh the talks i'm going to give later this week will be in a different place because i'm going to be on retreat but i'm going to see it's a little opportunity to give some talks on the mass to you but the books that you see this one here, this is the one that goes on the altar. Uh, this is the, it consists of all the prayers that we say when we celebrate Mass. This is called the Roman Missal, all right? Uh, and so this is the same prayers that are said in any Catholic church throughout the world, though it may be different translations that we use, uh, but it's the same prayers. It's pretty awesome when you think about that, that every day the same prayers are being said in every part of the world by different priests. So that's called the Roman Missal. Then... What we have our readings in, a lot of times people say, oh, that's the Bible up there. It's actually not, it's all from the Bible, but it's not a full Bible. It's called a lectionary. 
And so the lectionary, we call it lectionary because it comes with the wor Latin word lexio, which means reading. Uh, and so it has portions of the readings from the Bible in it. If you went to Mass every day, you experience at least the Gospels you would hear, almost all of the Gospels in the span of a year. You might, there might be little parts here and there that you don't hear. Uh, but 